The views and opinions expressed by the host and participants are their own and do not reflect the view of the companies they work for. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to episode 12 of My Name is Mario. And this week we are here with Brian Baglow. Uh, welcome, Brian. Welcome to the show. Hello, Pietro. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really ple a pleasure since, uh, Dave Bradley gave me like your contact, you know, I've been, you know, reading a little bit about you, what you're doing and it seems excellent. It seems, uh, super, super interesting and something I would like to know a little bit more about. So I'm, I'm very glad to have you here. Um, also it's the end of the, the holiday season. Of course we are recording it yet in still in July, but it's going to be live in August. So um, it's, things are starting moving back again. We, are, we have probably Gamescom around the corner. So uh, people are going to be active and also relaxed. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to, 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 to ask you a few things. But as usual, uh, I need to go for the, um, um, for, for the AI and see what the AI had to, had to say about you. Brian's career began at DMA Design where he contributed to the iconic Grand Theft Auto. His talents in communications led him to become Rockstar Games' first global PR manager in New York. He then ventured into the nascent mobile gaming sector with Digital Bridges, a leading Scottish publisher. In 2002, Brian founded Indoctrament, Scotland's first digital games agency, collaborating with over 150 organizations globally to integrate gaming into creative and educational practices. Since 2009, he has been lecturing at Edinburgh Napier University, emphasizing interactive media's transformative power in creative industries. Brian also founded the Scottish Games Network in 2004, which has grown into Scotland's key industry body for games. He recently spearheaded Scottish Games Week in 2022, focusing on the game's ecosystem's transformational capabilities. Building on this, he is developing a new cluster to position Scotland as a global hub for games education and creation. Additionally, Brian is an expert in applied game technologies and gamification, often consulting for media, tech ecosystem. I had actually forgotten I do some lecturing now and again at Napier. So um, yes, thank you for reminding me. I, I must uh, must remember to get an invoice in for the last year. But um, yeah, <laughs> please well, do. I had, I had forgotten. Um, and, and yes, actually, it only goes to show the power of AI. Uh, I'm very impressed. Yeah, so I... I realized just before we we logged in to talk to each other that it's 30 yeah. years this year since i got into the games industry um i've 30. tried to escape a few times but i keep getting dragged back it's this this incredible gravity of the sector um although we're yeah. going to talk ecosystem from this point on tell me to you know i want to start with, with one question right you say that you want to uh mm. so you founded a scottish game network right that was in 2004 yeah. If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and basically you want to put back the the, the Scottish um, gaming industry, you know, make it become like something more important, like a new hub of uh, of, of gaming gamification. I don't know. I know that you're very much into gamification, but like, what does that mean? What are you? Why you think Scotland had that has that that potential? That's a big question. This this could this could span several episodes. Um... I'll try and keep it really quick. It, so Scotland has okay. been a pioneer in games from the sort of the, the late eighties, early nineties. Um, the soul of the home computer revolution here in the UK was the Sinclair Spectrum, um, which was the original kind of home computer that really kind of broke out and got a lot of families excited about the future of, of technology. Um, and they were manufactured here in Scotland at the Timex factory in Dundee. And local legend has it that a number of them failed QA or fell off the back of a lorry and ended up in homes um, across the city. And that really kind of gave Dundee a little bit of a leg up in terms of <clears throat> the sheer number of devices out there. And of course, as soon as you got something like a, a Sinclair Spectrum, you realised that dad was not going to be doing the accounts on this. Uh, Mum was not going to be storing her recipes. Uh, the only useful thing they could do was play games. Um, and all the old magazines at that time came with, you know, big sort of centerfold sections full of basic code. And so you could sit and type in several hundred or several thousand lines of basic and um, build your own games. So it, it kind of gave 
the city a bit of a, a head start and that in turn gave Scotland a bit of a head start. And so we've been pioneering. The world's first video games degree was created in Dundee in 1997 by Aberty University. So we've always had this kind of pioneering role. But in the last 10 years, the last sort of maybe 10, 12 years, the evolution of the game's ecosystem has accelerated beyond you know anything we've known in the past. Games are no longer confined to dedicated hardware, consoles, basically. They're now mm -hmm. being played on non-dedicated hardware, mostly these things like mobile phones, um, tablets, etc. And they're being seen alongside the, the world's biggest software, Facebook, you know, TikTok, um, Spotify, YouTube, you know, all the big video audio streaming services, the biggest social media networks, and it's completely recontextualized games. And then, and at the same time, the tools and technologies from games are now changing the wider world. You know, so everything, everything coming out of um, Hollywood at the moment, everything from Disney, whether it's Star Wars, Marvel, is reliant to quite a large degree on virtual production, um, which relies in turn upon the games engines like the Unreal and Unity engines. Yeah. And this is true yeah. across areas like manufacturing, construction, medicine, healthcare, education, etc., etc., etc. So my goal with Scotland is to really join those dots because globally we still look at the games industry and think it's the stuff that happens on Xboxes with AAA games being the pinnacle of creative, um, you know, challenge. Whereas I see games as becoming a far more integrated part of our everyday lives and more and more of the digital future being influenced and supported and changed by games. And I want to put Scotland at the forefront of that. Okay, are there are there many games? Is it like the Scots are avid play, players, gamers? Games are as popular here as they are everywhere else in the world, Pietro. You know, that that's okay. the honest truth. It's not so much the consumer market, it's not the fact that there are so many gamers, it's that we have an industry here, we have an ecosystem here where I can yeah. reach out and actually find and identify and bring together all the different people from government at a national level down into the public sector organisations through into you know the education pipeline, the colleges, the universities, and then, of course, all the studios. Um, thanks to the Scottish Games Network, I've spent the last 20, dear God, 20 years you know, talking to them, supporting them, writing about them, organizing events with them. Um, and so pulling them all together and going, listen, guys, this is how the world is changing. We can be at the forefront of this. Yes. We can be pioneering the ways in which games are changing the world. And for me, that's too big an opportunity to pass up. That sounds, some, yeah, no, well, I, I understand it. I understand it. So, and um, so, you know, like my, my my experience with Scotland, it's very limited to just you know my 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 past employer uh, had a huge office in mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in Glasgow, and uh, mm -hmm. I you know for, for me it's always it's never never been in Scotland, never you know never never been there, so I don't really know how it works. And then therefore that's why when I read uh -huh. that you want to make it become like you think there is an opportunity there, there is a you know then and and what must be done so that so that Glasgow, Dundee, so the whole region will flourish more than what it is now, of course. Uh, so the, the games industry, which, you know, we both know and love, um, can be incredibly insular. So it's very, very inward looking. Um, the whole world you know, the whole games world will go to a very small number of places. So everybody goes to San Francisco for the game developer conference. Everybody mm -hmm. goes to Brighton for the uh, develop conference. Everybody's about to hit uh, Cologne for Gamescom. But very, very few people from the games world go to anything outside, you know, the games specific events. Um, so, you know, we've got film, television, festivals we've got the you know the whole range of festivals happening in edinburgh over the whole of august um they don't feature games um and the games people don't you know unless you're going as a as a, a an audience member there, there's no kind of crossover there's no collaboration so i think the opportunities to open this up to join all of these dots to get those conversations happening yeah. to make 
get that networking kind of effect happening and make those introductions yeah. um, is is right there in front of us. You know, if we can get the rest of the creative industries, you know, performing arts, theatre, film, screen, television, animation, music, literature, talking to the games guys and vice versa, um, it can build a completely different dynamic and open up entirely new opportunities that I don't think are really being even recognised yeah. within the games industry um, anywhere in the world right now. Okay, yeah, well, that, that, sounds, that, that, that sounds reasonable. Um, there's another thing also that for me, like, it really, you know, trigger something here. You know, I, I heard you talking about, you know, you were working on uh, mapping of the video game mm -hmm. ecosystem. Right. So the ecosystem, I understand it as being bigger than the actual industry of video game, but like everything around mm -hmm. it. Right. And so the, the question, the, the immediate question that I you know that I come to my come to my mind, where do we stand? How are we doing as a video game industry, especially after I don't know if you heard about these things about the, you know, after the pandemic, you know, uh, layoffs, you know, no one heard of it. But, you, you know, it's, no, of course. And, and so. There was a period of stagnation, and now are we seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel? Are you seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? Well, how do you see? Tell me a little bit more about this, about this mapping. What did you find out? Sure, of course. Uh, so as strange as it may seem, uh, until 2020, when I, I kind of stepped back into games after a, a few years away, um, we had no idea how big the industry was in Scotland. We had no idea how many studios the number of people they employed, and we certainly didn't really have any kind of overview of the education pipeline. Everyone kind of knows about Abertay because it was the world's first, but which other universities are offering courses? How many students are studying? How many startups are we getting out the back of it? Um, and how many startups are we getting out the back of it that don't make games, but are maybe making tools or tech for games or using tools and tech for other purposes? So I, I picked up a small research grant from uh, the Innovation Centre in Edinburgh called Creative Informatics. And that basically paid me for three months to go and start pulling all of this data together. Um, and it's the first time it's ever been done, you know, and for a small country, which is part of the UK, um, it's it was surprisingly difficult because up until I think 2014, 15, we didn't have any industry codes that allowed you to identify game developers. So just going and searching company's house would not return anything like the, the, the actual accurate number. So I, I went and basically built this huge, big, ugly Google spreadsheet that kind of um, identified the games companies, the companies that said they were games companies, but which weren't, the companies which uh, are games companies, but only in potential. So they exist in company's house. They might have a Twitter account, but have never produced anything. They have no active kind of online presence and really built this data set that we've now handed out, made sort of publicly accessible to all of the researchers, the universities, the public sector and say, look, this is a snapshot of 2022. Go nuts, you know, figure out from here where we take it next. Um, but it's such an important piece of uh, data, such an important um, set of data, that this can't be a one-off, this can't be a snapshot, this is something that's going to have to be done on a regular basis. And the fact that yeah. we know yeah. more about the blockchain ecosystem in Scotland or the space sector in Scotland than we do about games is just incredibly short-sighted. Um, so I, I'm trying desperately to change that and get the, the government to procure someone who on an ongoing basis can sort of go out and say, here's the number of startups we're producing. Here's the number of pe yeah. people they employ. Here are the games that we produce. Because to go back to this um, evolution of the sector, if all we're doing is premium content games, i.e. games that come out for PC, you know, through Steam or Itch and are paid for up front, is that because that's a choice or is that because free to play is big and scary and unknown and we have nowhere anywhere in the country where new studios can go and learn those skills. Um, I would suspect the latter, but that's just, you know, 
my gut instinct at the moment rather than based on hard data. So there are some really big sort of knowledge gaps that we're facing. And this isn't just Scotland. This is kind of in the, the UK as a whole. Um, so if I can use Scotland as a, a pilot almost, thanks to being able to identify and pull all these different people together, then I'm, I'm really keen yeah. that we start to recontextualize games and see games as not just cool stuff on Xboxes that makes tons of money, but it's something far more fundamental and integral to our digital future. Okay. Okay. I understand. Um, this is all very that's... worthy, by the way, Pietro. I'm, I'm, I'm starting no, to sound like yeah. I'm ranting on a soapbox. I can do fun as well. I promise. <laughs> no, I know. I know. I know you have like interesting stories, but this is this part of the conversation for me. I want to start with this just because like, and then we're going to talk about something maybe a little bit more fun, but that's very mm -hmm. interesting for me to see also how we have been doing collectively, maybe not, uh, we, we haven't, we haven't been as good as looking at the bigger picture. I, I think that the games industry is so big and still growing that it's really easy to overlook the fact that there's more to it than just the consumer market. You know, the Xbox, PlayStation, Switch, and then this monster that is still not quite trusted called mobile. But beyond that, there's far more um, that's happening in and around games. You know, all of the immersive technologies, VR, AR, XR, MR, etc. It's a all the tools in tech are coming from the games world. Um, the rise of the metaverse is literally, you know, trying to take games out into completely different contexts. Um, and whether it's a single metaverse, a number of metaverses, we're not quite sure. Um, and for me, you know, the, the future games is not the sort of the red dwarf like better than life where everyone's wearing headsets and society collapses. It's Jesse Shell's 2014 visions of the game apocalypse, which is all of these advances in technology, all of these new sort of interactive experiences, micro payments, you know, full face tracking, location based gaming, etc, 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 are all contributing to making our overall lives that little bit more playful, that little bit more fun. And I think there's far more interesting, exciting and experimental ways in which this is going to start impacting our lives in the next 10 years. And again, I want us, I want Scotland to be a, you know, a world leader in that. Of course, of course. And do you think there is any low hanging fruit that we can just like go grab it? And like, is there anything else? Is there anything, not anything else? Is there anything out there that we could, we could, should try to explore or the type of avenue that we should try to, you know, to go to like right now, easy, something that we're not doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so, Two things. One is, um, I've already done it. So, so this is one thing that's already starting to happen. Is uh, as part of the Scottish Games Week program, I created an event called More Than Games, and it's a games event oh. for people who don't make video games, right? So, creating opportunities and encouraging that sort of like that, you know, cross pollination and networking. So, we pulled in people from education, from government, from the performing arts, from screen industries, from space data, cyber, fintech, all of these other areas that are all genuinely interested in games. They're looking at what we do, right? We, we make engagement better than anyone else yeah. in the world, right? You, you can spend more time playing games than you can do almost anything else, unless you're a slow reader and it's a very thick book. You know, you can spend thousands of hours in, in a game like EVE Online or World of Warcraft or whatever it happens to be. They're all really interested in how they start to you know, understand their user better, how they, you know, potentially design for joy in their user. We do that, but we're so fiercely focused on gameplay and mechanics and our own thing that there are very few people out there outside, you know, the, the, the sort of the margin walkers like Jane McGonigal and some of the people who are kind of coming from a slightly more academic side of things, uh, Jesse Shell indeed, um, we're still not recognizing the huge transformative potential that we as a sector have. Um, and sitting, uh, you know, writers down with a narrative designer or sitting, you know, um, urban planners down with level designers can be a, a truly wonderful thing. And then the second thing is um, in the education pipeline, stop game students 
just talking to game students. You know, get the students talking to the marketers, get them talking to the business students, get them talking to, you know, the the design students. Just building uh, or just creating students with the technical and creative skill to make a thing with literally no context for how to get that thing out onto the market, how to publish it, how to support it, is not doing us any favours, you know. So just not changing the courses, but just opening it up and getting students from different disciplines and different schools within a university to talk to each other, I think is a fairly simple way to start making some pretty big changes happen quite quickly. Okay. Okay, well, that, that, that's, you know, sounds, sounds very, sounds like there is something that we can do um, pretty quickly. And who should attend that conference then? Who is the, who's the perfect audience for you? So, the, mm, damn it. I was going to say, but it's easy, it's everyone. Um, but that, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the get out of jail free card, isn't it, Pietro? Um, yeah. So the, the honest answer is anyone who is interested in learning more about games. So there's space for educators, academics, teachers, there's space mm. for business leaders, there's space for pioneers and tech entrepreneurs and founders from whatever discipline, the whole of the tech sector, the whole of the creative industries, the whole of the education pipeline. You know, if we actually started having serious conversations about how games could be used in the classroom, you know, not just the commercial release games, how do we reimagine education in the, the 21st century where every single five and six year old is a gamer and then again to come back to Scotland when they get to choose computer science in third year at high school something like 70 percent of them refuse because it's seen as dull and boring and having nothing to do with with, with games there's something wrong here so you know it, it, it it's a tricky one but we're building from you know, the re very early stages going, come and find out, you know, this is not just about the, the FIFAs and Call of Duties and Grand Theft Autos and Minecrafts. This is about far, far more, you know, um, from design, playful thinking, you know, everyone yeah. loves the word game. I mean, there, but there are, there are, there are a few attempts around, you know, out there, you know, not that, not as many as they should be, but to, uh, you know, e-learning and also doing mm -hmm. programs and small games for, for school to learn, but it's always something something local in general there isn't like a, a, an attempt to do something like maybe of a of a bigger scale mm -hmm. um but definitely there is definitely that's one of the you know when i asked you i had this in mind right how can we um kind of find a liaison like a point of contact between what kids nowadays love which is games and what kids don't really like like we also did i was a terrible you know mm -hmm. um, a student uh, I hated it, but I, I love video games. I remember the time I was like playing like the first, you know, FIFA's, uh, you know, in, in the, in the early nineties. And, um, and, and it was like, if, if only the two, of course, I, it's hard for me to imagine that FIFA and with FIFA, you can teach me math, but like, if they only were better, uh, better tools for me to remain mm -hmm. engaged a little bit longer, you know, a little bit more to understand math or physics or whatever, I'm sure that there has to be something more that we, uh, we can do there. And, um, and I think that for me, mm -hmm. that's the, that's a low, that's the lowest hanging fruit. Like really the one yeah. that just don't even need to reach out to, but you can just buy it with you, you know, just moving yeah. your hand. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And what you're seeing ad, ad, across not just Scotland, but the UK is there are a number of schools and colleges that are now setting up esports labs, you know, so they're getting some mm. fairly, you know, uh, hefty computers and they're getting, you know, nice desks, chairs, um, cameras, microphones, and they're using games as an engagement tool for kids that don't necessarily engage well within a, within a classroom and within uh. sort of the traditional learning process. Now that's fine, but esports and games or game development are not the same thing. And I think this is another area of deep misunderstanding when it comes to schools and the organizations that support schools, the, 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 the public sector bodies, because they talk about games and esports, but I don't think they actually understand. Games is design, development, production, and publishing of you know, mostly new intellectual property, or, you know, we can take it down into work for hire, separate argument. Whereas 
esports is professionally or competitively playing video games or organizing events and streaming um, those those competitions. Totally different skill sets. They run parallel. You can't have esports without games, but the career outcomes, the um, you know the 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 value adds to the economy. It's the long term prospects are totally totally different. So I'm all in favour of esports labs, but again, I think we need that kind of connected thinking, which is once we've got them in, once we've got them playing, um, how do we then take them forward and get them, give them the tools and the, the sort of the skills to create on their own. Uh, so it's, we've kind of taken that first little step, but how we actually build out the next steps is, again, I don't think we're, I don't think we're there yet. How's the, how's the Scottish, Scottish Game Week doing? Well, 2024, what can I say? Um, nobody in the games industry is having fun in 2024. So uh, in the next sort of week, by the time this comes out, it'll all be out there and official. So in 2024, we are hitting pause. Um, there has been an awful lot of upheaval. There has been an awful lot of uncertainty. Uh, in Scotland, we tapped into Scottish government funding in 2022 and 23. In 2024, we've had some shenanigans, um, chaos, upheaval uh, in Scotland and the wider UK, which meant that things got pushed back and pushed back. So what we're doing is we're pausing for 2024, coming back in 2025, bigger, better, faster, more, with something beautiful, interactive, engaging and fun. You know, something that I think will redefine the way you think about games and games events. Um, at least that's the plan. So, yeah, simultaneously, a bit sad, but also it means yeah. I can take a week off with my seven-year-old with a clear conscience at the beginning of August. Um, and also it gives me well over a year to plan uh, 2025. I've also got to write this national strategy for video games. So that's keeping me a little bit occupied as well. National strategy for video games? Yes. Okay. Did I, did I not mention? So... At the tail end of Scottish Games Week last year, there was a whole group of people from across the industry who sat down with the Deputy First Minister of Scotland, really to outline a lot of the things we've been talking about this morning, to say, look, games are not being supported, right? We've kind of fall between, we fall into the cracks. We're not tech, so we're not, you know, none of the work that you're doing, none of the support and infrastructure you're putting in place applies to us. We're absolutely, definitely not screen in Scotland. The rest of the UK games are a screen business or a screen industry. We're not in Scotland. And while we're technically technically part of the creative industries, we're not really well known or understood or seen as anything outside the AAA market. So we could do better. And so we sat down, we gave a whole presentation, the Q&A with um, the Deputy First Minister, the Innovation Minister. And at the end, we had a, a list of asks, not demands, but asks. Um, and it was Shona Robertson, the Deputy First Minister, who basically said, right, that one there in in the middle, a national strategy for video games, let's start there. So I have the backing of the Scottish Government to go out and, and look at this national strategy for video games. And so what I'm doing at the moment is I'm writing an action plan, which is a much shorter document in government terms. You know, well, maybe the combination of what you're doing now, like on a national uh, scale to together with the pause that the the Scottish Game Week is is having this year, mm -hmm. maybe all this is gonna give you like a like more time to do something better, stronger, more interesting, more entertaining for next year. You know, I can all, I can only imagine by you know next year after having a break of one year, you can only put together so many so many ideas, so many things. So probably it's gonna be even more interesting to go to. I think so. I think so. But my hope is that this can be you know transformative this can be something that, that really starts to to have an impact um and it doesn't have to be huge policy things you know create a ring fenced fund to to create new intellectual yeah. property it can be quite small things like getting the government to use its power to to convene people and get the right people in the room um agree on a set of definitions this is what games is this is what games are i beg your pardon this is what esports is um you know, here are the here are the areas that we need to 
build our knowledge and here are some really simple ways of making sure games are included in all the work they're doing to support tech startups and the tech ecosystem so you know it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a big big thing and um, one of my one of my favorite recommendations right now is we have a a, a whole series of clubs every library across Scotland has a free weekly club for children you know the under fives called bookbug okay and uh, every year the government commissions a whole series of authors in Scotland to write books um and so you can cover things like climate change you can cover things like education every child gets a whole bag of books free so if we can do one which is about games and gaming and you know you can you can make video games and you know i'm not sure how but just the opportunity for a minister you know sitting down with a whole group of under fives and reading a story about why making games is important and why games can help us be more to you know more together more communicative and all of that kind of thing that's a beautiful and joyful thing so i'm trying desperately to find a way to, to sort of make that fit and make that that um you know, part of the overall um, program because it doesn't have to be the just give us the money and get out of our way. It's how do we start to change the culture where games are seen, uh, you know, screen time is seen as negative inherently, yeah. um, that games are just things that happen on Xboxes where you steal cars and shoot policemen, this being, you know, the land of Grand Theft Auto. So I, I think there's lots and lots of ways in which we can start to change the perception of games. Um, and, and really start to get some sort of cultural shift around why this is important. Allow me to be a little bit cynical here. Go for it. And, uh, and say this that... This is the games industry. It wouldn't work if somebody wasn't cynical. <laughs> awesome. No, but I, I am really cynical. I don't have great expectations for that. Sorry, and I know it goes like, you know, you, it's all like your effort, but I see that really, I don't know, nothing really changes. We are still like, there are, especially I mean, some countries more than others, of course, it's not always the same, it's not the same everywhere, but still the, the view on the, on, on, on gamers remains and changed, it's slightly changed, and of course, more people play. But it's more seen, you know, and more more women are getting into games, which is which is which makes which plays a big role in my opinion. But still, too little. It's most of the time casual. It's it it could be better. And I and I keep saying uh, and I keep saying this right. For me, it's even ourselves. Mm -hmm. We do not portray the right way the image of a gamer. How? I don't know if you saw, like, I, I remember there, there was, like, uh, up till, like, a couple of years ago, there was even a, um, a show, and an event here in Warsaw, here mm -hmm. in Poland, and, and, the, and the big uh, banner was, you know, like, was something like, I don't remember what was the title, but it was, like, Warsaw Games Week or Warsaw Games Event Expo, something like that. And, and the picture is this, I don't know how to, like, put, let me put it this way, Ide idiotic looking fella with big glasses with you know spiky head like holding a holding a control oh yeah. like it's always the image and even when we do it for ourselves we portray ourselves in that ridiculous way it's irritating to me it's irritating and then any anytime you see this and even on tv whenever there is a commercial mm -hmm. for something it's like always like that Ah, yeah, oh, well, be, which is fun, but it's also it's not really what it is. So now, of course, I'm not trying to to, to demonize the way we are portrayed, like especially in a commercial. It's the, if you want to show fun, it's happening in a family. You show it that way, and it's totally fine. But even if when it's us about us talking about us, then we put this picture of ourselves looking like like the geeky guy that just like mm -hmm. thinking strong out like that. And it, for me, it's just like, if we don't change the way we see ourselves, how can we expect that the vision of ourselves is going to change in the future? And I'm very cynical about it. I don't really have great expectations for that because like so, we, we still see ourselves that way. 
and and this is why when when it comes to ecosystem versus industry it's i'm ecosystem all the way because you're absolutely correct um and it does not reflect reality you know we know that there are 3.05 billion gamers in the world as of 2022 so presumably more now um they're not all 16 to 35 year old angry young men playing at home on a console yelling at their tv and their parents you know or the bedroom in their parents house it's nonsense it's like wordle is as valid a game as call of duty you know it doesn't matter if you're playing candy crush saga on the bus for five minutes in the morning or you're investing hundreds of hours in eve online or, or any of the big mmos if you are playing a game you are a gamer my my mum says i don't play games i was like you post your wordle score every single day and she's kicking my butt at words with friends too but she's not a gamer right she plays more games right now than i do but she's not a gamer mm. and so this this um very kind of cliched reductionist view of uh gamers is entirely our fault we've not only allowed ourselves to be portrayed like that and in some cases encouraged it but we've not moved beyond it we've not sort of set challenged it and and we're and this is pretty much global but you know it, it's treated differently in different countries you know in, in japan otaku culture is is just seen as as pretty much very mainstream um and the reality is so many people are now playing games every nfl star is probably playing nfl at home every premier league football is probably playing um you know is it ea football at home or football manager every fashion model is probably playing something on their 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 phone when they're you know, in in business class jet setting yeah. to to Paris, we're all gamers, right? But the 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 cliche, the stereotype has become so ingrained that it's going to be really hard to shift. Well, you know, like you know, deep down, I hope you're right, and I hope we're going to manage. Um, I don't know. It's just hard for me to believe we 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 we're gonna we're gonna do something better. And plus, and then there are also you live in a country that in a way is privileged, uh, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because I I think that there is a completely different view of the gamers in your country. Mm -hmm. But if you come to a country where I live currently, it's much, it's that 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 type of stereotype of the geeky game gamer that it does nothing. Uh, useful if it stays like one hour and a half mm -hmm. playing a video game. It's in in here. It's still a thing for you know. A, a lady might tell you, "Oh, you're oh you, you play a game. Oh, that's a thing for boys." Mm -hmm. That's still super normal to hear it. It's incredible. Like so, I agree. But yeah, I agree. Hope and, for and, we, and it 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 does it does change and it does vary. But but we as an industry have have allowed this to to kind of dominate and because we're so insular so self-reflective you know the games industry talks about the games industry you know we have this tedious i'm going to swear fucking concept called a real game and real games are worthy real games are worth your time real games are what we all aspire to make anything that's not a real game is you know beneath contempt it's something that nobody should be should be bothering with and depending on who you are and where you've come from and how you've come through this industry or, or your experience playing games your notion of a real game can be it's only on pc it's only an mmo it's only on console mm. it's got to be an fps so it's, you know so somebody playing um a bingo game you know for real money cash against tens of hundreds of thousands of other people across a particular country or a region that's not a real game and and i have to be honest and say fuck you you know how do you get to decide what is it might not be a game for you but that's a totally different argument you know i do a lot of talks and i've got one slide that i include in every talk i give to people in the game's ecosystem and it's a screenshot of candy crush saga doesn't see what it is but i say does anyone know what this game is and there's normally at least half a dozen people in any audience, from students to executives, put their hand up and go, that's Candy Crush Saga. And I'm like, right, hands up everyone who thinks this is a good game. 
And I can pretty much guarantee in almost every room, no hands go up. And I'm like, so you'll be glad to hear that you're wrong because by almost any measurable KPI, this is a massively successful, influential game that has attracted more people into gaming than almost anything else. It's been going for well over 10 years. It has millions of players. It's generated massive amounts of money. You know, it might not be winning awards, but the fact that it's not only retaining players, but attracting new players, you know, generation after generation, is massive. And what we get caught up on is that's not a good game. And what we actually should be saying is it's not a game I would enjoy. You know, it. that's fine. But we need to get away from this idea that the, somehow there are some games which are valid and some games which are not. You know, there are games that you like and that are massively creative and, you know, kind of win all sorts of awards. And there are some games that are aimed at a very, very different audience. You know, whether it's a, a much younger, um, child-friendly audience, whether it's um, your mum, her do doctor, the dentist, his dog... Let's not get yeah. carried away. We, we should no, absolutely true. shun it. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. I, I agree with you. So speaking, you know what? Speaking of games you like and you don't like, um, do tell me a horror story of a game you worked on or the worst game you worked on. I don't know, just do you have a horror story for us? So, so my, my, my very first game, the, the, the game I started working on at DMA Design was, was this one in the background, Grand Theft Auto. I understand uh -huh. that's done quite well. Um, so, you know, that, that was my starting point. Um, my most recent in-house role was with a, a, a media company here in Scotland um, who did music media. They, they did magazines, they did uh, award competitions, they did concerts, you know. It was all about classic rock, heavy metal, hard rock, prog, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I went in as the ex executive producer. They started a games... A division and so I was running the games division and I went in and they had uh, commissioned a game for mobile called Metal Hammer Roadkill. Metal and Hammer Roadkill. Metal, Metal Hammer, Hammer colon, Ro Roadkill. Roadkill. It doesn't exist anymore. You'll be able to find some clips of it on YouTube but it was hands down the worst game ever. Um, so they, they, they commissioned it and paid for it up front. Not milestones, not on deliverables. They just went, how much? Oh, 200k. Okay, here you go. Um, And then realised about six months in that somebody should probably be t paying attention to this. And uh, so I came in as the executive producer. So rhythm action game based on heavy metal. And so you ran down a road in hell, you know, a highway to hell indeed, um, and demons came towards you. And based on the colour, uh, black or white, black or red, one of the two, uh, you, you basically hit the appropriate button and it was all synced to the music. And it was a whole bunch of heavy metal, hard rock tracks from well-known artists. Um, so by the time I joined the company, that was in place, that bit was there. But the timing was really off and it was laggy as hell and it just wasn't great. So sat and played it and reviewed it and kind of went back to the development studio and said, OK, based on that build, here's what needs to happen. Um, and they came back and went, we're not sure what you mean. I went, well, it doesn't work and it crashes and it's really laggy and there's there's a whole bunch of things and going through each individual track, here are the issues. And they went, we don't understand, we're finished. I went, what do you mean you're finished? And they went, well, we're out of money. And I went, that's not how this works. And uh, they, they were like, no, 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 well, you, if you want anything done, you'll need to pay us. And so that wasn't ideal. Um, and then at the same time, I, I went to the commercial director and said, okay, uh, I need to make sure that all of the music's nailed down, that we've got all of these tracks. And he was like, it's fine, it's fine. Spoken to them all, it's great. Now, this was my first experience working in music. And in music, 
there are two people who so there's the songwriter who owns the the rights and then there's the okay. mechanicals which is the recording which is normally the label and so you've got to go and talk to both of them in order to make sure you can use the the, the music and guess what pietro they both want money then my favorite bit was the um in music licensing, you have something called a most favoured nation clause, which means that if you pay somebody more, then the person with the most, or the group or band or whatever, with the most favoured nation has to get more money as well, because you cannot give anybody more money than the most favoured nation. So Really? If some, that sounds stupid. Oh, yeah. You have no idea. No, I have and no so, idea. It, but this is this is this is true. This is true. You can you can Google it after after the podcast. Oh, mental, yeah. absolutely mental. God, like Brian. So that sounds like a horror story for real. You really gave I me a horror have, story. I have a whole book of this kind of shit. I haven't even covered. It's like the pouting, the breakdown, the sulks. The, there was a a confrontation at the game developer conference, but I need about three people to die before I can really sort of d drill into but, that. Otherwise, I'll just but get this sued. story though sound this story sounded like the pinnacle story of you know of everything that can go to shit went to everything shit. that could possibly have gone yeah, wrong. Yeah, pretty much went wrong. Before before we close that another another thing we have like very limited time, so let's be mindful about of the time. Tell I know you, I know you call yourself, uh, um, no, well, like uh, you're exploring an alternative mm -hmm. way of being a father. So, alternative Indeed. fatherhood. Give it, give me, give me what. Tell me, tell everyone because I want everyone to know a little bit more. Brain, uh, uh, Brian, brain. I was about to call you Brain Maglo. Is there Brian? Happens all the time. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, Brian, as a from a personal point of view, thank you for the horror story. Now, what does it mean being a, like an alternative? fatherhood you know like exploring that avenue so it, essentially i i have two grown-up kids who i i love and adore um i also have a seven-year-old and i made a conscious decision this time around to be a uh, far more fun and engaged dad and just basically use it as a way to avoid growing up um so i go everywhere with my son it's we go to the park i'm playing in the park if there's a pl if, the cl if there's a climbing frame we're climbing on the climbing frame if it looks like it's really nice so i, I live on the east coast of uh, scotland on the, the right across the road from a beach if he arrives and it's really nice and calm and sunny we're in the water you know it's if we go to the beach and we don't you know step off the beach wet sandy soaked and happy something's going wrong so the whole point is is just getting involved. It's like, you know, I'm I'm 53. I don't want to be the guy sitting at the edge of the park with my phone, checking emails mm. and going, yeah, 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 just go and play, amuse yourself. Um, I get to go have fun and play games and and do all of these cool things, and and it does include video games. You know, it's we're we're learning uh, Minecraft together. I'm exploring the outer limits of uh, the extraordinarily poor parental controls in Roblox. Um, you know, just to make sure I know what's what. But uh, I'm introducing them to so many of the games that I loved growing up. It's it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, just to, you know, just to chime on that one you were saying, but like, and then we can close, like, this summer, I spent like the, my usual uh, three weeks in Italy. Mm -hmm. I always go there for on holiday. I yeah. think it's the best place in the world to go on holiday. On holiday, not to live there, just on holiday. But okay. and and then I discovered that I have big time claustrophobia. So I was with my with my daughter, of course. Thank thank God, it was mm -hmm. also my uh, my family. So my my wife was there. So we went to Osimo, Osimo, which mm -hmm. is like um, in a, a, a small town in the in the market region, and mm -hmm. there was that basically and a, a, a city underneath like land so like really oh, I, I don't know how yeah. to call it so like really you know went down like like 20 30 40 50 meters so i just mm -hmm. you know we started a there was a guided uh tour so we go down and then and you know after the first like 50 meters so the, the guide stops and start talking and i feel something 
you know, coming up, I was like, okay, control, you control your reactions. It's okay. It's okay. And now, you know, the way these tunnels that were going and mm-hmm. you were seeing, and my daughter was there in the front, standing in front of the guy, like, yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I was like, and you know, thank God it was my wife was there because at, after we did like another 50 meters, mm-hmm. I had to run backwards. Like exactly. Like you were like running ah! with my hands in the air. I just, and then I skipped the guy too. but my daughter was down there and that is something that I really wanted to do with her. But anyway, thank you, Brian, for Testify. sharing that type of, yes. Thank you for sharing like the part of your personal life, the horror story, everything about the, 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 the Scottish industry the video game industry as a, as an ecosystem not just as, a, as an industry so thank you thank you very much uh, unfortunately this is all the time that we have today for uh, for brian but hey big round of applause for you and for everything you're doing and thank you by the way for what you're doing and for being here to the show thank you very Absolute much brian pleasure. it's been a total joy talking to you pietro i really enjoyed it and um yeah i'll have to return the favor i've got a new a new podcast starting up called more than games which you'll be hearing about at some point soon. So I may be able to return the favor and get you on at some point soon. Bam, bam, bam. Done it. I'm going to be there. So thank you everyone for for this show and see you next time.